We can't really talk about um, embedded systems without dealing with the operating systems of um, the devices that are used in embedded systems, simply because um, if you're going to have some sort of embedded control system, then it's got to have an operating system and these have some particular characteristics. There are three of them. The, the main ones are the microkernel system, the layered system, and the agent-based intelligent control system, which is not quite an embedded system. It's, it's actually quite a sizable system in its own right, but we'll, we'll include it here for an analysis. We'll start with microkernel. Uh, this was developed in the 1980s, um, partly I think alongside uh, Unix. Um, now, the the problem they're trying to overcome was to minimize the effort of porting to different um, platforms. Um, if you remember, Unix was one of the first operating systems that uh, was um, hardware independent. It wasn't developed by the manufacturer. And as a consequence, Unix had to be able to be ported to a whole lot of different platforms. So if it wasn't Unix, it was something like that, where the, the problems of, of porting from one place to another mattered a lot. And so they wanted to do that. Now, the problem, uh, the problem is that if you, if you are porting an operating system, there's quite a lot of it you have to rewrite. So the whole idea was, well, let's make as much of these device drivers and other services as much like any other program as we possibly can. Get them out of kernel mode and just make them things that we can call on. Uh, so that was the general approach to it. So. Um, the, the uh, whole idea is separate the device drivers from the kernel and uh, run them as normal programs. And the operating system mechanisms are dealt, then dealt with address space management, thread management, and inter-process communication. Now that was the whole idea, and uh, it seemed to be, um, you know, it was theoretically very attractive and uh, seemed to work well. Now some of the advantages of microkernel is that the server separation allows the service to fail without bringing down the entire system. So, I mean, if you had a device driver that's a little bit buggy, it could fail, and the, it, it, it would shut down, but the rest of the operating system kept going. As opposed to a monolithic system where if, if a driver failed, the whole thing failed. Um, different services can be uh, uploaded, uh, unloaded, as required. Um, in in the days of uh, now, um, operating systems, we'll, they load in device drivers all over the place. Um, I'm not sure this is such a, an advantage that it may once have been. Uh, nevertheless, this is something that comes up when uh, talking about maintenance and upgrades. The microkernel uh, allows you to upgrade the device drivers and to load them up independently much more easily than otherwise. Message passing does allow independent communication and allows extensibility, so that's a pretty good point. And it's there are easier and faster integration with third-party modules. Now, they're all the advantages. I almost have to say that it seems that most of these advantages are theoretical. The disadvantages of microkernel, um, they, instead of being micro, um, Microkernel implies a small operating system. In fact, it's not. It tends to be bigger than a monolithic system. The kernel itself is small, but the whole operating system is big. The potential performance loss through uh, con uh, constant um, switching, um, sw context switching in and out of kernel mode, is actually quite high. Um, and although there's been a lot of work done on it, that's never been successfully overcome. Um, message passing bugs are really hard to fix. This is a note from somebody who's had a look at it. Um, the process management is quite complex. So um, it's one of those systems where as soon as you break things up into, into independent modules, you, you, you've solved some problems and incurred a whole lot of others. So the disadvantages of microkernel architecture are not um, trivial. When to use a microkernel? Now, if you're going to use a develop a microkernel style uh, system, then a lot of opinion is that it really underperforms a monolithic system for a number of reasons. Um, the first, the first reason is the um, 
the, the overhead of switching context in and out of kernel mode. And the second reason is the overhead of all the communication, uh, inter-process communication. And although it's not easy, um, I mean, nobody said working on these things was easy at all, but microkernel architectures are relatively easier to work on than monolithics, simply because the modules tended to, tend to be isolated and you work on them independently and that makes them a little bit easier to work with, a little bit easier to understand. However, making it all work together, that's another problem. Now, the big competitor to, to uh, microkernel architecture is monolithic architecture. Uh, sounds like huge, um, but it's not. It just means that it's in one block of code instead of being separated out into um, isolatable layers. Monolithic architectures uh, arose in the 1960s um, and the operating system, although it's in one block, it is separated into several layers as you can see there. And there is strict layering. It seems that they learned very quickly that um, the only way to keep, keep this under control and keep it from, from descending into chaos was to have strict layering. Now, the advantages of a layered operating system, since there's less software involved, it's faster. There's also less inter-process communication and less context switching. There is one single piece of software. Uh, it should be smaller in terms of source code and compiled forms. Less code usually means less bugs. Um, not necessarily, but it, um, it, all, all other things being equal, I think the economists had the term ceteris paribus, paribus and all the other things being equal. So in theory, uh, because it's one, one block and it's less code, it should be, um, have less bugs and it should be faster. Disadvantages of a layered operating system. Um, coding in kernel can be challenging, so that can be a problem. Uh, bugs in one part of the kernel do have strong side effects. <laughs> all right? the, the whole idea is you really ought not to have bugs, but you've been working on these operating systems now for 40 years, you should have figured it out. Kernels can become large and difficult to maintain. Inevitably, there is feature bloat on these things. Um, code integration is tight and it's difficult to do correctly. Um, this gets into this question of complexity. And unless your architecture, even in a monolithic system, unless that architecture is extremely well thought out, then you can get some complicated complications and they can be difficult to maintain. Uh, monolithic systems tend to be either very hard to port or just not portable at all. So that's a bit of a problem. When to use a layered operating system? Um, despite the many warnings against them, the answer is most of the time. Um, when you expect to be able to write an operating system and um, use it for a long time. Um, so uh, monolithic systems, for example, have been written to work on the one family of chips, so the, the Intel 86 um, family of chips. Um, these, um, they keep getting bigger, but the operating system doesn't have to be extensively rewritten for those. Um, when hardware performance has overcome the problems of size, uh, so um, uh, I guess um, the trend now is not to use a specialized operating system but to use a general purpose operating system because the speed of the hardware has now overcome uh, the performance problems that used to be.